Um, so good morning to everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, all of our kind introductions and also to the organizing committee for inviting me to this event. So um, I would, I'm very, very happy to be here to share with you what I know about recreation toxicity, recreational drugs. So um, before I start, perhaps um, one time the audience will have a look at this. So um, how many of you actually have heard about the read of this newspaper article? The one on top is actually found in the KL National uh, yeah. Press. It says that there's a new party drug that might have killed youth at the festival, and they recognize, I mean, they identify this drug as a possible, uh, possibly to be methadone. And in this uh, party, there are some Singaporeans who have alleged they have taken the drug and are actually uh, hospitalized in KL. So during the same period last month, March was an interesting month last month, um, in the Jakarta Post, they said that there was a dance or music festival and the party actually had three mortality. So they suspect it's also because of recreational drugs and one of them unfortunately is actually a 26 year old Singaporean who died in Jakarta. So as we are, if you have read about this news, I wonder if you are thought to be the same like the topic of my talk today, recreational drugs, what is happening on the so first I'll start a little bit about the uh, classific classification of recreational drugs. Uh, for me, this has gone very far beyond what I used to read in the EM textbooks for my exams as a student or as a resident. So I'll share with you how we look at it. Um, we divide it into stimulants, hallucinogens, and depressants. And I further this divided into two groups. <laughs> so on this side, you actually have the classical drugs. Uh, which some of us might have the opportunities to treat patients with this toxicity, for example, cocaine, amphetamines, ketamines, heroin, opioids, or benzodiazepines. Um, the new things, the new kit on the blog is actually the global cycle and the global agents. So under the stimulus, you can see that there's actually a rapid increase in the number of stimulus drugs that are new. So preparazine started in about 2006 to 2008, then ketamines came on. So about, it was banned in about 2010. So methadone is one of the catamones. And in 2010, there are new drugs, synthetic cocaine and piperidols. Under the handle of synogenes, we have uh, things like synthetic products and even plant-based plant -based products. So example is uh, methyl xanthine, spice, and uh, the latest on the market is this thing called MBOP. It's actually a king candy. It's manufactured as a teen uh, piece of square paper. It's actually a post, also called slotters. So people put it underneath the tongue or you can use as a spray. So all these actually has uh, hallucinogenic effects and uh, stimulus effects. And under the new devices, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, GHD, and which is actually uh, what, like what Dr. G. Ong has mentioned. It can be used as a day break drug. Uh, the recreational drug users use it to get high. So as you can see, recreational drug toxicity, so it is actually increasingly, it's actually increasingly uh, becoming more common and there is a changing pattern of use because the uh, people actually mix the classical drugs with the new agents. So uh, we'll move on to look at the prevalence of drug use around the world. So uh, most of this information is from the drug, uh, World Drug Report 2013 that's published by the United Nations Office of Drug and Crimes. So um, there is estimated that there are actually uh, more drug users globally, but um, they report that problems associated with drug use like dependence and disorders are actually, uh, yeah, actually steady. So this reflects that even though we have more people using the drugs, the number of problems have not gone up. So this is just a reflection of perhaps the world population is increasing, therefore the number of abusers have also increased. But there are two areas of concern uh, mentioned in this report. One is of poly drug use. So um, this is actually very well studied in the US, Australia, and in some parts of the UK, where people combine prescription drugs, mainly sedative and tranquilizers, together with the illicit substance. And also, um, the other area of concern is actually increasing number of MPS. MPS is a novo psychoactive agent. I will talk a little bit about it in the later part of the talk. And the next speaker, Dr. Yao, should speak about this. 
So in terms of the global picture, in uh, 2011, it was estimated between uh, 4 to about 7 percent of the adult population have used an illicit substance in the preceding year. So if you look at this graph, you can see that since 2009, uh, opioids, opiates, and uh, cannabis, there is an increased trend of use, whereas the prevalence of use of cannabis, ecstasy, and amphetamine seems to have slowed down. And, so next, we'll talk about uh, drug-related uh, death. So I would like to mention that actually um, drug use can, is actually associated with uh, extreme harm. People do die from drug use. So um, you can see that this is a report in the US papers, drugs now leading accidental death on cause, um, cause of death. And this is in the UK. Uh, online website, we can the drug that sort. So uh, according to the European Monitoring Centre for Drug and Drug Addiction, they report that um, on the average, the mean age of people who die from drug-related uh, causes um, is between 24 years old to 44 years old in the European countries. So this is actually a very young age group, and most of the deaths are actually preventable. So it's quite sad that we're losing quite many young people from um, just drugs. So this is again a, a table showing that for the global uh, drug death, it's estimated that about 120,000 to 247,000 people have died per year globally. And this actually gives a mortality rate of about 22.3 to 54 deaths per million uh, population. So this is actually quite a significant number. So in the next slide, I'd like to show um, a little bit about the study that was done in the UK uh, emergency department. So this shows a five-year trend of the EE visits that are related to drug use. So we can see that from the year 2006 to 2010, there's actually an increase in number of EE presentations that are related to uh, drug toxicity. So this actually does put a strain on already a very stretched healthcare system. So what is the statistic on the uh, Asia Pacific in this region? So according to the UN OBC report that's published uh, this year, uh, oh, sorry, last year, uh, methamphetamine continues to be very popular. There's a resurgence of ecstasy. And in this region, we are not slack either. The emergence of the MPS, new psychiatric agent, is growing rapidly. What about Singapore, we we'll ask ourselves? So in Singapore, we continue to be a transit location for trafficking of uh, amphetamine-like substance. Uh, our main drug of use is heroin, and there is and its use continues to increase. Methamphetamine remains a uh, very significant problem, especially for young drug offenders and people who are caught for the first time using drugs. So this is the statistic for Singapore. Uh, so next, I'll move on to the individual drug groups and talking about sorry, uh, individual drug group and uh, see how it's the patterns of use across the world. First, we'll talk about opioids. So opioids, uh, this includes uh, heroin and opium, and it's estimated about 0.4 percent. These are the countries that have high prevalence of use. So in some parts of Asia, Europe, and North America. You can see from this graph, uh, the areas that are shaded green are the areas where they have been reported to have used opiates. Uh, the ones in the darker green are countries like Russia that has a high prevalence of use. The next graph, the next picture, will show the annual prevalence of opioids in uh, 2011. So you'll realize that this actually covers small areas uh, like the states. Australia and parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. Why is there a difference? The difference is because uh, for Oakport, they included uh, numbers based on prescription drugs. So they have prescription uh, analgesias, or drugs analgesias that have been misused. Therefore, there is actually a much higher uh, prevalence of use. So next, we move on to cocaine. Uh, we can see that in the in all across the world, with the exception of North America, the rest of the countries in the world actually reports a higher use of cocaine in 2011 compared to 2004. So 
again, it's also an increasing use. This, this is the map again. You can see the states, Australia, and parts of Europe. Very high usage. Cannabis. So cannabis remains the most widely used illicit substance. So the prevalence of use is about 4% globally. And in this region, uh, cannabis use is a sort of upper trend. And I expect this to be increasing over the years because we have seen some parts of the states have actually legalized cannabis. So in this picture here, it's taken off the BBC website. It shows the UK police. They have seized about 90 cannabis plants in the North Fork in August last year. So they say that you know, every once a year or so, they actually seize these plants from some remote parts of the UK. So this is how the cannabis plant actually works. Again, uh, the graph, this, this picture will show the use of cannabis in 2011. So, as before, states, Australia, Malaysia, and Europe, very big users. So, for amphetamine like substance, uh, the use of this ATS is also a widespread problem. So, estimated close to about 1% of the global population has used the drug in their intent. In Asia, it's an increasingly very popular and also in Africa. Okay, you can see quite a lot of countries are actually daily users of uh, amphetamine uh, substance. And you can see in the Southeast Asia region where we are, it's a very popular This is for ecstasy. And now we'll come on to this thing called uh, novo or new psychoactive agents. So what are these uh, new psychoactive agents or what we call NPS? So NPS is actually an umbrella term for unregulated uh, psychoactive agents that actually, that actually mimic the effect of the controlled drugs. So we can see that across the world, many of them, many of the country have actually reported news. So these are highlighted in purple. Uh, for example, in among the countries in Europe, the top five countries that actually report very high uh, MPS use is one, London, the second one is Poland, followed by uh, France, Germany, and Spain. And this is a table showing the regional emergence of MPS by groups. You can see that among Africans, Americans, Asia, Europeans, and Oceania, the Europe countries report a very high prevalence of use of MPS across all classes. The synthetic cannabinoids, 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 for example. And uh, according to the UNODC report, there are uh, the three big countries that have reported uh, the emergence of MPS to the United Nations. Uh, ranking first is, of course, Europe because they have a high usage actually uh, followed by Asia and then America. So in Asia, most of the countries that report the emergence are actually in the East and Southeast Asia, uh, parts of the Middle East. And in this region, um, in Asia, the two common MPS that's been used is Italy and Triton. Triton is actually a plant. This is how it looks like. It's, uh, it's a plant, a tree that is grown in the Southeast Asia. And it's used, I mean, it's known for its uh, stimulant and narcotic effects. So sometimes what they can do is they can look it into tablets like this. So this is called Captain Crepton. You can get it off the internet. <laughs> so it's very, uh, you can see the packaging is very exciting. You know? It's trying to like, get the young people to try it. So this table actually shows the classification of different classes of MPS and the countries that have reported these drugs to the UFO. So in Singapore, we actually have reported synthetic candy noise. Mm -hmm. An example is spice. Spice is something, it's not um, the spice that we used to cook, but it's actually what, like, um, they use this synthetic candy noise and they spray on these and show it, then they sell it as a herbal product. So people can um, burn it and slot it, for example. Synthetic candy noise, an example is methadone, or the trade name, you know, the trade name is Meow Meow. Okay, so um, with this emergence of MPS, um, the recreational drug toxicity scene is actually have this changing paradigm. Um, in order to you know uh, outdo the law enforcement, 
the legislation. So all these drug manufacturers, they always manufacture the new molecules. They make some changes to the molecules and they market the new drug very rapidly. So in that sense, the, the law enforcement is always the same time. So in the UK, when we used to, when I was doing my HNDP, we used to go to the nightclubs and we do survey on the drug, on the drug users, I mean the clubbers. So sometimes they'll give us information like, oh, they've tried something new. Another way to actually keep track of what is um, happening in the world is that we actually go around with the music festivals, or we do it monthly, once a month, in the nightclubs area, you will put up portable uranus, and then uh, the next day, I'll have a pleasant job by some time, to go back to the clubs and collect the urine. So we cycle the urines of urinal and send it for analysis. So this is one way how um, I then keep track of the new drugs that's coming. If this is way ahead of um, what will be reported in the literature because the literature is always a step. So what is the problem associated with MPS? So one of the things is that MPS is marketed as an eagle high. So as the name suggests, it's actually a misnomer. So when people see the word eagle, they think it's acceptable. Or they think that, you know, that is, since it's acceptable, it's eagle, it shouldn't be much side effect. But actually this is not true. Another problem they have is that they are actually marketed and sold under relatively generous name. For example, professionals, <coughs> farmers, stores, incense, and even plant food. Okay? So this, uh, this is actually a uh, packaging of spice, also known as And the internet, the internet is actually a uh, uh, big problem <coughs> for, uh, in terms of the MPS because you can see that there are like hundreds of websites online that allows you to actually buy uh, all these MPS off the uh, internet. So according to the UN OEC report, 88% of the country responding to the survey said that the internet is the key source of supply in their markets. So this, um, these are actually packaging of the MPS. This is benzo puree, since APD, methadone, okay. So it's a synthetic okay. So the first time when I saw a patient who told me he had taken go okay, I was like, what? So that was for me, because I'm not seeing it. So you can see that on the internet, you can buy it in grams or many grams or even kilograms. So all you need is internet access and credit card. But please don't try in Singapore, the CMB is available. So this is one website of how you can actually buy a FPS off the internet. You just have to Google buy, for example, benzo puree, you have a website, and they'll tell you how to buy it. And you don't have to give much details. So now back to the reality. Uh, Singapore, Singaporean dies of suspected overdose in Jakarta. CMB working with the, in, with KL to probe the lurch of drug abuse on Singaporeans. So uh, in this recent news, is it a one-off fact? Or is there something changing in the world of recreational drugs or club drug medicine in Singapore? Will, that, will this actually become a regular thing that we see in the ladies? So as, I think as practicing physicians, we are actually quite interested. Because if you do see these uh, cases, they will be quite um, different because we haven't been seeing it much in our day in setting. So hopefully, uh, with the primary prevention, that's a very strict regulation drug laws that we have in Singapore, this would but if you do, uh, what I'm going to do next in the last part of my lecture is to share with you all some case studies that um, I've actually seen and attended to these patients in London and also waiting for a year of teaching. So of all these cases, I'll first go through two, um, three different cases. <coughs> one is on chest pain, one is on drowsiness, the other one is on orthopedic. And for each of the complaints, I actually included a classical drug and a newer drug. So this is um, a case of chest pain. The new lady has chest pain, started cocaine one and a half hours ago, came in quite agitated and sweaty, or a case of crushing the chest discovered. She's a bit tachycardic and hypertensive. So uh, we'll definitely ask for do an ECG on her. So the ECG is actually pretty normal looking at sinus tachycardia. Ran off the troponin, it's actually negative. X-ray, there's no real power access, no video wider wider media standard. So we do know that you know, uh, cocaine is a risk factor for uh, cardiovascular disease and emergency. 
So it is reported that in the first hour of use after stopping or using cocaine, the risk of actually an MI or risk of the skin increases 24 times. And uh, for the people who use cocaine versus those who don't, the risk of a non-fatal MI actually increases by seven folds. So how do we manage cocaine associated chest pain <coughs> with uh, no signs of ST elevation? So first of all, it's as usual oxygen. Aspirin can be given because uh, cocaine causes plated aggregation. It's been shown in studies that uh, benzodiazepines is as good if not superior to even GTS in controlling pain because they help with the uh, basal constrictions that's induced by the cocaine. But we have to remember that this is very different from our usual management of uh, patients with uh, coronary artery disease, that is, fatal doctors are contraindicated. Because animal studies and even human studies have shown that fatal uh, doctors, when used in the setting of cocaine associated chest pain, it actually worsens the outcome because it worsens the basal constriction. If you would like to read more, you can actually find a circulation article in 2008. So, for this patient, what we did was we uh, gave him a medical pack. His pain dissolved, and after uh, we monitored him in the emergency medicine unit for 12 hours, repeated the troponin was negative, so he was discharged with advice to stop uh, his drug use and receive seek help from the community we have services. Another case, this is a 30 year old gentleman, also has chest pain. This time, he spotted methadrol. So, methadrol is a catinone, it's a synthetic catinone, uh, it's a new local uh, stimulus that's available in the market. And this is the drug that they say was suspected that the people have taken in the coming out of this plastic. He's diaphoretic agitated, and this is his final sign. This is his ECG. We can actually see some uh, signs of possible uh, ST elevation. So for this patient, we actually activated cardiology from the a &E, and he was sent for emergency angiogram. So, uh, how many people think that he has a conclusion? So the answer is actually the angiogram is up to be positive, uh, negative. He's got very clean vessels. So we think that ST segment changes are due to uh, basal spasm from the stimulus use. Subsequently, we get two the echo for him. He's got a normal DF because it's a young patient. Um, his chest pain and the ST elevation segment actually resolved after we've given him some uh, nice repair, monitor him for one to two days. And also, uh, he was also discharged well with advice to stop using drugs. Um, third case, a case of drowsiness. 28 year old gentleman found collapsed in the streets surrounded by needles. Needles are small, he's hypoventilating, uh, heart is about 50 beats, he's a bit of tender, and he's only responsive to pain. So, what is the possible diagnosis? Is there any antidote? So, what syndrome is this? Oh, yeah. It's an opioid syndrome. So what are the possible drugs that can be uh, responsible? Things like heroin, methadone. Okay. So the antidote is actually naloxone, but we have to remember that naloxone half-life is much shorter than the half-life of the drugs. So we need to monitor the patient closely. We can either give repeated boluses to reverse the respiratory depression, or we can put a patient of confusion. Okay. Uh, bear in mind that there's a risk of acute withdrawal or agitation when we're trying to reverse the so it must, it must be done in the normal area. So case 4, another case of drowsiness. This time now, it's also a 28 year old gentleman found with the same symptoms but in a nightclub. So um, it's unlikely that people will go to a nightclub to take uh, heroin, right? Because they are supposed to get high and fall asleep. So what do you think this patient has taken? So the answer is um, GHD. So GHD is actually a drug for use. Uh, it's very popular in the nightclubs in London. So people actually use it because they say that it makes them euphoric uh, and it's actually a pro-sexual drug. So a lot of the gay clubs actually like to use GHD because they will go for their uh, sex party and then they will get high and they can't remember much stuff. <laughs> These are also names, uh, these are analogs that have of GHD, so when they are eaten, they have to analyze the GHD in the body and they use the same kind of So GHD, to remember, it actually, um, once we have ingested it, the onset of action is in 30 minutes, uh, then they actually feel high, 
and the half life is also about seven minutes. If you look at this bottle, you can see that the GHB when dissolved in water is actually a very clear, colorless liquid. So this is actually a problem. Um, in the club, sometimes what people may say is that they have empty bottles of clear water, they think that this is water, they drink it and then they really pass out. If they don't come to a health care person who's study enough, they actually die from respiratory depression. Okay, so um, GHB toxicity will happen. So now they actually do relax, they appreciate the dancing more. But in severe cases when they actually overdose, they actually become very drowsy, they go into coma, they can see it's a brain cardiac and they can die. Okay, so the management is actually supportive and because of the very short half-life, the center that I work in, they actually can eyeball and say, okay, this patient is a GHB overdose because they have a typical look, they say it's a clean shaven chest, etc. Et <laughs> so if they are quite sure that there are no other problems, it's just a G overdose, you will understand their left lateral position because they tend to vomit and wake up. And within one hour or so, with regular monitoring, sometimes, most of the time, you actually wake up and we have stopped the baby. So it's centers that are not so, um, they don't see that many cases, what they do is they are worried to incubate the patient and there are cases where the patient will wake up and they are very violent and they can't the mm -hmm. So, um, the last two cases, this is our agitation. So I have a 25-year-old guy who is a regular GHP user who comes in for some signs of agitation, saying that there are demons following him, wanting to harm him, so he's a bit sick. So what's your diagnosis? What do you mean by a regular GHP user? So when we say regular, it means that they use, we ask them how often do you use, how many times a day. So when we classify someone as a regular G user, it's either they use it daily for the last two months or they use it for like two to four months. And they can withdraw for regular users if they don't have anything for six hours. So this case is actually a GHP withdrawal. So GHP actually acts on the GHP receptors and the GABA B receptors. It's a little bit like alcohol. So with chronic use, it creates a, a tolerance. And once the patient doesn't have enough uh, G in there, they actually can withdraw. The initial symptoms of withdrawal is like, they like alcohol, they get tremors, they get a little bit, you know, unsettled. Uh, they have a bit of vomiting, but within 48 hours, they actually can seize, they can go into a coma. And these patients, uh, the difference between this and alcohol withdrawal is that this patient, the withdrawal state actually lasts for very long. It can be up to two weeks and you actually have to use very high dose benzodiazepine to control them. So for that patient, we actually use up to very high dose benzos. We can even up use up to acid. We have given up to 200 mg of the acid in the first 24 hours. Even with this, sometimes they are not uh, sedated enough. They get very agitated. We have to intubate them, them on the protocol infusion. And there might be a role of Ecofan in helping withdrawals because Ecofan is actually a beta B, B, agonist. So the last thing is, uh, 20 year old took three tablets of ecstasy, started to hallucinate. She has got high temperature, high BP, high heart rate. She has got increased bone poor GCS and is in all of disorders. So how does this happen? Uh, what is MDMA? So MDMA ecstasy, it causes a release of serotonin, dopamine, and technologies. Uh, this effect can come on to about within an hour of taking the drugs. And the severe toxic effect is not is idiosyncratic. It's not related to how much you've taken or whether you've been exposed to it previously. So this patient actually has got the features of serotonin syndrome. She is in a coma, CNS effect, she's hypothyroxic, and she's not signs of a uh, neuromuscular excitability. So for her, she actually was very sick. She ended up in the ICU. She actually ended up with multi organ failure from hypochlorexia. She had a stormy stay of two weeks, but she managed to get out of the ICU and I reviewed her in the clinic with a normal liver function, function, a renal function, normal coagulation, and other things were not improving. And she did say she's going to say, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does it mean for a medical physician or a medical toxicology or EP physician? What does this mean? It means that uh, recreational drug toxicity is going to be more complex because the people actually use the classical drugs and new drugs. And the new drugs might not even be known in the scientific world before uh, you see them, correct? So, in conclusion, recreational drugs is actually a universal problem. Remember, there's classical versus new drugs. And thanks to the internet, there's an increasingly use of a range of global uh, psychoactive agents. So before I end, I'd just like to uh, mention uh, my two supervisors from UK for sharing the slides with me and thanking the audience for all. <laughs>